things on earth, beyond the highest, the very highest heavens, that is the light that shines in your heart. It's difficult to hear that, isn't it? Because we might immediately think of everything that we do that dims the light, or that avoids the light, or that runs from the light, or that distracts us from the true source of the light. I was so touched as Thang just described his desk with all those latest technological miracles and in a way they are a miracle you know i can communicate with all of you in a in a in a moment of writing something should i wish and should you wish at the other end it is a miracle but it can also distract us from the light and especially from the light that shines in our own hearts i think i need this theme, gaining simplicity, I think I need it on a daily basis. I need to keep renewing my awareness of it because our social conditioning is so strong to make everything complex and complicated and we do indeed live in a complex world and we need to understand that. But we can understand it from the perspective of what actually serves us, what helps us, what aids us, what supports us, and what supports us most of all to, to meet the world and to meet ourselves within the world from this place of light rather than from a place of confusion. In fact, the very phrase light takes us to the word enlightened, and enlightened simply means, I think, that we know who we are. We know why we're here. We know what a great gift life is. We know how we can serve life, as well as allowing it to move through us. So one of the beautiful teachings that Sue read earlier from the Jewish tradition said, the world stands upon three things, upon truth, upon peace, and upon justice. And I thought to myself, what could be simpler? What a revolution we would have if we could actually take that one bit seriously. Because the truth of the truth is that we are far more alike than we are different. That we could understand one another even through the chasms of our differences much better than we do and with much more consideration and care than we generally show if we wish to. It is our choice, which screens we turn on, which communication channels we use most effectively. We know also the truth that our personal well-being depends on how we regard the well-being of others, whether we see ourselves as guardians of one another, or whether we see ourselves as competing for limited resources. When we can move even momentarily into the realm of the unlimited, which is where the abundance of love comes from, then it becomes much more, uh, much easier and much more self-evident that we could share and share and share and only benefit that we would be giving nothing away that we were not also receiving. Make no mistake in this matter of self and other, comes this wonderful Buddhist teaching. Everything is Buddha without exception. It's a very telling phrase, isn't it? Make no mistake in this matter of self and other, where we usually see such um, difference, such competitiveness, sometimes such dissociation. No, says this teaching, everything is Buddha, without exception. You could just rephrase it, everything is divine, without exception. 
Everything is infused with the sacred, without exception. In fact, a poet much, much later, Goethe, said, open your eyes and the whole world is full of God. But of course, it's sometimes hard to open our eyes. And that's a truth too. So when we think about this notion of truth, let's take it to its simplest and most profound level. And let us be supported by that, not um, overwhelmed by it, not diminished by it, not too much in awe of it, but just allowing it to inform how we are with other people in an easier way so that we can also be easier and more loving and more hopeful and more appreciative with our own selves. The world stands upon three things and the second of them according to this teaching is peace. And when I was thinking about this in the context of gaining simplicity, I thought how often we disrupt our peace by worrying about things that in fact are remarkable only for how trivial they are. We often spend so much energy on choices where actually either one would do and both will be entirely forgotten if not by the end of the day then certainly by the end of the week or by the end of the year. Rather than um, harboring our resources, saving ourselves for the moments of um, sublime joy, sublime bliss, or when we truly need the energy to be compassionate and to be discerning and to be forgiving and to be tolerant in situations that are difficult, we fritter our energy, not just on things that don't matter, because the small things of life really do matter, but on our worries about them, on our thinking that it really matters if we have pasta today or rice tomorrow. I mean, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is that there are many, many people in our world who have neither pasta nor rice, and that matters. And we need to save some energy for that. And that, again, gives us simplicity. It allows us to be discerning. Um, I, when I was writing my notes for this talk and thinking about it during the week, I thought, again, it's, it's a Buddhist story, about two monks who came to a river. Some of you will know this little story, but it's a good one, so I'll tell it. Um, two monks came to the river, and there was a woman there who couldn't get to the other side. I can't remember if there was a boat and there wasn't a boat, and you know, there should have been a raft and there wasn't a raft, but the point was that one of the, one of the monks carried the woman on his back to the other side of the river and put her down. And hours later, the other monk was still saying, do you think that it was right to have given that woman a lift on your body? And the monk who did, in fact, help her across the river, which I'm sure is highly symbolic in ways that you can all uh, imagine, said, you know, I put her down hours ago, and you are still carrying her. <laughs> And I thought that was such a good story because we do carry things on, don't we? We often find it really difficult to put things down. And sadly, the things that we often find difficult to put down are the worries. Whereas the um, exuberances and the things that have gone very well, we sometimes dismiss all too quickly. So let's really dwell on what's gone well. Let's really love it. Let's really appreciate it and have more of it as we think about it. And let's think less about what didn't go so well, especially once we've decided how we could do it differently next time. The world stands upon three things, upon truth, upon peace, and upon justice. And I think this is a very, very crucial one for those of us who want to make any kind of claim to the immense resource of living life from a spiritual perspective, especially in relation to the question of entitlement. 
You know, it's a very strange thing, but if I was to ask each one of you, do you expect your life to be perfect? You would laugh. You would say, no, I don't expect it always to go my way. I don't expect it always to be perfect. Um, I don't expect my opinions always to prevail. And yet, very often, our dis disappointment would indicate that we did expect that. That our sense of entitlement to things going well is actually pretty high. And that we can feel very, very disgruntled. A friend who's teaching in a kindergarten class told me that she, one of the things she finds quite challenging is that for many children when they hear no, it's the beginning of a process of negotiation. It's not no, but it's, well, maybe, or in a minute, or next week, or, you know, and when you've got between 20 and 30 children, no sometimes has to mean no. But we often take this as a personal affront. We often feel it as an offense to who we are. And this makes it much more difficult for us to think very deeply and intelligently and with the strongest mind possible about how we are creating, how we are contributing to, how we are being part of a more just world. But that is the call of spirituality, that we don't rise alone, we don't fall alone, we rise together or we fall together. And understanding that, understanding the intimate and intricate nature of our interdependence makes sense of this call to justice. <coughs> I think we also meet this call to justice much more ably and much more skillfully and much more cheerfully when we ourselves feel full when we feel full of light, when we feel um, energized by the teachings on love, when we feel ourselves to be part of a magnificent universe, no matter how small our part may be. So I would add two more to that list of what the world stands upon. I would also add beauty, I think this is a profound need for us. And I noticed that somebody lit a candle in gratitude for the music, because of course the beauty of the music comes straight to the soul, feeds the soul in the most miraculous way. But so do the beauty of the teachings, of the poetry of the scriptures. And I very much hope that you take the order of service home with you and really allow those words to become yours, perhaps to write them out or make a card so that you are reminded of them during your days, which may be far too busy or may feel far too empty. To be rich in love is to be very, very rich indeed. To be rich in possessions is often to be distracted. So how do we allow ourselves to become ever richer, not just in the idea of love, but also in the practices of love? Starting, of course, with ourselves, healing the wounds of self-pity, self-hatred, self-violence, so that we are better able to meet the woundedness in others, and so that we are better able to meet the strengths in others without feeling any envy or distance. These teachings, these teachings coax us back each month to remind us again and again and again of that light within ourselves of the path of love that we walk together, of the choices that we can make that are both uplifting and profoundly healing, and that will continue to heal us until our last breath.
from Mechtield of Magdeburg, as Shalani also read to us. O oh, sweet and loving spirit. That's all, the loving spirit. When I stay asleep too long, oblivious to your many blessings, then please wake me up and sing to me your joyful song. Sing it to my soul, sing it to my spirit, sing it to my mind, sing it to my feelings, sing it to my woundedness, and sing it to my gratitude. It's a song without noise or notes. It's a song of love beyond words. It's a song of God's faithfulness beyond the power of human telling. I hear it in my soul. I hear it in my soul when you awaken me to your presence. Blessed be.